Hi, this is OG Star Wars. Welcome to my channel. And today we are going to analyze an article from Disney Star Wars Dumb, done by Itchy Baka. Thank you so much. And basically he's covering, and I am too as well, is production staff barely knew the movies. So I find it very interesting that when we get into this article, um, when they discuss the Death Star, and we are gonna watch part of the video as well, um, how much they how much they confuse Death Star 1 with Death Star 2, um, the basic overall, like they, they tell how big the Death Star is, but when you look at it and you look at the Death Star um, wreckage, on that planet or on that moon um it doesn't necessarily fit it's like they didn't even take in count for you know the the glass metal transparent still and even the throne chair the throne room chair wasn't even um annihilated or um disintegrated is the best word in the um in the blast in the de um, destruction of the death star 2. And transparent steel basically is a um, steel type glass that is used like in TIE fighters and other fighters as well as, um, you know, on ships and all that. So even, and it's very strong, but it's not like saber proof at all. And it's blaster proof, but not like explosion proof, I guess you could say. So um, that really doesn't make sense. So we're gonna take a look at this article. I'm gonna go ahead and read it out and we'll analyze it some more. All right, so let's get into the article by Disney Star Wars is Dumb. Production staff barely knew the movies. Folks often talk about current creative staff within Lucasfilm being unfamiliar with the basic lore of Star Wars, particularly the lore in the expanded universe. And they're right, but it's much worse than that. They barely understood the original trilogy. Recently, Ichibaka wrote about IML animation director Hal Hickel, who struggles with the meaning of the word war in the title of the franchise. That was the most shocking statement come, to come out of Lucasfilm to date. When someone that far up in the food chain within Lucasfilm can't understand the basic meaning of the title of the franchise, what possible hope can there be for Star Wars? The correct answer is none. The Skywalker Legacy is a documentary that includes on the home release of the Rise of Skywalker Blu-ray. IML visual effects director Chris Voy talks about how they went back to the model of the Death Star to look at the details that they were going to recover in the wreckage that appears in episode nine of the Disney trilogy. Lucasfilm design supervisor James Klein talks about taking a bunch of photos of the original model and then talks about the curvature and texture and banding on the dish saying that one of those bands is the trench that Luke flies down. I'll repeat that again. One of those bands in the Death Star 2 model they're looking at is a trench that Luke flies down. So let's go ahead and take a look at this video. One of the ideas JJ brought back to episode nine that initially he had thought of in the early days of episode seven was going to a crashed piece of the Death Star. I was just fascinated with the, the question of what is it to live in the aftermath of everything that we saw in the original trilogy. So the idea of pieces of things that we had seen that, that had been blown apart. There was just something that was, I don't know, haunting about it and kind of beautiful. It was one of those things that felt like an idea that you have suddenly finds its purpose. So basically we see that JJ was using concept for The Force Awakens and he, as we heard, he wanted to revisit, you know, the tragedy of the OT. However, when we get more into this um, portion of the documentary, The Skywalker Legacy, you're going to find out that they, they are just misunderstanding the OT. And with that, 
misunderstanding um, even how the Death Star was exploded. And I'll go more into that when we get into um, where Emperor Palpatine's um, tower was located, um, his throne room tower, and how that too looked as if it was misplaced or misunderstood on where the location of it was at when they were putting this together. For a long time, we knew that there was gonna be a moment in the story when we're gonna see the Death Star. First thing we kind of wanted to do is go up into the archives and take a look at the original model for this star. Look at this weird core thing. And then we can get some of that into our yeah. uh, approach to Ray. So we went up, took a bunch of photos. We wanted to really understand the curvature that houses uh, the dish and then the texture itself. The texture of the Death Star is just as identifiable. You can see these kind of banding, which when you get really close, you understand, oh my god, one of those bands is actually the trench that Luke flies down. So here we go. This is the proof here. He is looking at the model of the Death Star 2, you know, and so we could tell it's the difference between the both of them because Death Star 2 is not fully constructed yet. Even though it's operational, as we see in the movie, it's not um, fully constructed yet and you know he's like oh one of those trenches there is where Luke flies down I'm sorry sweetie but he did not fly down Death Star 2 trench I know that they are identical but here's an interesting fact the Death Star 2 was the second Death Star as we know it and it was significantly larger than its predecessor measuring over 16 or 160 kilometers in, dia in diameter and was built after the destruction of the first Death Star at the Battle of Yavin. So we know that the second Death Star is 160 kilom kilometers larger. So that means even the, um, you know, the blueprint of it's gonna be larger. That means that there is gonna be changes with even the outside shell. So there you go. There's an interesting fact with that a really big issue in that it is completely ridiculously huge and found out that it was about 90 miles across. It's too deep to fit in the ocean, it's too tall to fit into the atmosphere, so we found out that we could just barely fit the dish way out on the horizon. That we're pretty happy with. And JJ looked at it and he kind of said it's a little too convenient. That on this part of the clip of the documentary here, we we hear that JJ says it's too convenient that they come across the dish. So let's just give them the border outer shell of what held the dish, which I find is funny because it isn't convenient that they end up stumbling across um, a portion of the hall of the Death Star. I don't know, but I will tell you one thing. When you look at the what they put as the wreckage, and we'll see that in the coming you know part of the clip that's coming after this is that the the tower the emperor's throne tower our throne room is also in the wreckage so we have just the outer part of the rim of the dish and just surrounding um surrounding platform surrounding shell or hull of the death star which isn't very big if you look at the how big the death star is so what we see on that moon is not a significant part of the death star but it's still, to me, too big for something to have survived in that type of an explosion. All right, so then we'll go from there and we see in this image, we see that the throne room tower is on top of the sphere, significantly away from the dish. So when you look at the wreckage, how in the hell did that portion of the Death Star, which is a tower, which is basically comes off of the hull. It's not inside the Death Star. And wreck is all of a sudden included in the wreckage and that that little tower survived the explosion or implosion of the Death Star 2. I don't think they understand whoever they have in charge, Voy or whatever his name is, I don't think they understand, you know, diameter. And basically they say, oh, it was so big that we couldn't do what we wanted. Um, they still really screwed up. Come across the dish. So we kind of reset. Maybe you would have just a piece of the shell 
with a little bit of the dish left in there to hopefully recognize it as what it is. You know, having the dish just being found is a little bit too convenient, but you know, again, like I said, let's just show the outer shell and the supportive rim of the dish, right? And also the tower that basically was, you know, further away from the dish on the top of the sphere of the Death Star 2. So again, that doesn't make sense. So let's go ahead and take a, you know, finish this article and wrap up this. And again, as always, share with me what you think about all of this in the comments below. So not only did they not understand that the Death Star Trench was not located anywhere near the dish, but they also didn't understand which Death Star Luke actually assaulted. And that's the thing that I am talking about here today as well. And we are talking about Death Star 2 for Rise of Skywalker, or at least a part of the hull or the shell, versus Death Star 1, where Luke basically, you know, you did the trench run and did the destructive shot, basically, you know. So because throughout the entire round, um, rambling sequence, James Klein and Chris Voy are both looking at the second unfinished Death Star, again, evident in the film or in the documentary of the Death Star from Return of the Jedi, which Lando Calrissian, who led the assault on, which even didn't involve the trench run. So not only are they saying, oh, that was one of the trenches, one of those trenches could have been where Luke did the run to destroy the Death Star. They forget to mention, and Lando's in the movie, they forget to mention that Lando's the one that led the assault along with Wedge and Neonim. And um, what's, what's so astonishing to me is that they have Lando Calrissian in the movie. Wouldn't that be fascinating if we could have seen his reaction to seeing a part of the Death Star, you know, surviving the explosion that he created? Wouldn't that be phenomenal to see his reaction and um, him getting, you know, like into the fighting spirit again, like we need to destroy the First Order for the sake of the galaxy. Just like, you know, and I mentioned this before, and this is a little off topic, but I'm gonna throw this in here. The um, Last Jedi, how phenomenal it would have been to see Luke's reaction of the death of his best friend and brother-in-law, Han Solo and how pivotal that would have been and how much more would make sense for Luke to snap out of his cowering, um, suicidal um, tendencies to get back into the fight because he realized that his choices that he made resulted in the death of one of his beloved friends and family members that would have been pivotal that would have tied the the true the sagas the trilogies together now i went off topic but see this there's also many opportunities missed and even in um legacy of the force when we if you ever read those series you know they go back to endor and there are pieces of our fragments of the death star that landed on the endor moon and they're, they're still big chunks, mind you, because how big the Death Star 2 is, and it wasn't even in full completion as well. But they weren't as significantly big as what we see in The Rise of Skywalker. And I think what matters most about the size as well is that the impact it has on the moons or planets that inhabit life. That would be catastrophic for life that size to hit the moon or planet in such a significant rate of an explosion that um, that all life basically would have seen, um, would have seen um, Armageddon base, you know, and, you know, so thinking about that, and mind you, I know it's like 30 years later, but in time reality, that's still a short amount of time for life to recover. For an atmosphere to recover, for a homeostasis to recover. 
So that's why it's off-putting to me to think about something that big and significant can um, survive an explosion and then land on a um, a moon that is inhabit you know that hos it's hospitable to life because we see that they don't need any breathers or life support um, you know every there's plant life you know animal life. You know, so we see species, we see animals, all of that. Within 30 years from that, I don't think life would recover that well, that fast. Because 30 years in a time frame is really, really short when you think about it. So in the end of the article, basically, Ichibaka goes on, there is absolutely no hope for Star Wars within the current production of the staff at Lucasfilm. And I... I agree. I, I think that there needs to be more care to the lore and what was established with the six original films. And so I'll go on. The most galling thing about all of this is how Disney portrays themselves as meticulously honoring what George Lucas created when they, they're the company that threw out in the entire sequel trilogy treatments. And there you go. So again, there needs to be special attention to the lore, especially the foundation, and that's the six original movies. And so fans that grew up with this, um, the sagas, the PT and the OT and the EU, we notice the stuff. We notice the, the, um, the lore breaking material that's going on, the lore breaking um, um, direction that they're going to tell their story. And I think with the movies, they needed to honor the lore. Then, you know, go off into a timeline that's not even established anymore. And then create another story that still is lore, that still is a part of the lore, but introduces, you know, maybe new planets and new characters, maybe a new species, but still keeping what is established. But when you break away from the movies and you're not telling the Skywalker saga, which I don't like that name because Star Wars is about the Skywalkers no matter what you think about that. Um, but moving away and telling another story um, that's away from the movies by still honoring like the world building and stuff, I believe should have been the direction they took. No special attention with the direction they're going with the lore. As we see with the dish here um, or the, the wreckage here of the Death Star, and how they are, you know, um, comparing it to, with um, how Luke did the trench run and all this. And it's, it's just saddening to see and hear that um, they can't distinguish between elements of the lore. And when fans call it out, we do get backlash regarding it and what I feel about that and what I'm going to say about that is yes there's going to be fans like me that are going to take special attention to the lore and call out any discrepancies just like with Ichibaka's article here does that make us um toxic no it doesn't it just means that we know the lore and we are seeing these discrepancies we're seeing these mistakes and we are critiquing them there's nothing wrong with critiquing them no matter who you are and if you like the movie for just the way it is and you like the nostalgia of having the Death Star, that's fine as well. I am not attacking anybody regarding this. I am sharing, just like Ichibaka with this article, is sharing the discrepancies with the lore and the misunderstanding of the OT. And um, that's all we have to share. So thank you guys for watching. Please add any comments down below. Let me know what you think about this video and the breakdown of it. And you know, if there's any other parts that I may have forgotten as well, um, I think between Ichibaka and I, and thank you again for the article here, you know, even with the tower, we covered it. And, um, but please again, share. And as always, like, subscribe, and share this video, and may the force be with you.